Hello and welcome to this video. On this video I would like to discuss another video by another YouTuber, Adam Neely. Now before we get into all this I've got to say I'm a huge fan of Adam's channel. He was a big inspiration for me on this channel. Um, I think that his channel has been an invaluable source of information about all aspects of music. They're always in incredibly well researched unlike mine you know he really works out what he's going to say and he goes out there and says it he has a lot of background stuff and they're beautifully edited and you know absolutely fantastic videos and I've enjoyed them for many years now um, a few days ago he put up a video asking if, if the uh, singer-songwriter Loive uh, is jazz now of course me being my age I'd never heard of this singer so um, um, i checked her out and then I watched the video and in that video for me a lot of the things I've been discussing about the gatekeeperingness of jazz is quite apparent in this video and throughout the video it's quite apparent to Adam who keeps sort of talking to himself in this sort of um, third person asking himself well, you know why are you bothered why are you gatekeeping jazz and for me, that's the overall question behind this video. Why is Adam feeling the need to gatekeep what is jazz and what isn't jazz? You know, that's a very interesting thing. Anyway, let's, let's get into this. I'm going to sort of um, supply commentary to that. Um, I've got some notes here because I'm not all um, <laughs> well-researched and scripted like Adam. You know, I make this stuff up on the spot a little bit like an actual jazz musician. And I think fundamentally that's what jazz musicians are, aren't they? They're people who make stuff up on the spot. So... You know, Adam can, if he wants, you know, do a, 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 a reply video. He asks whether I'm jazz, you know. <laughs> but I'm sure he wouldn't. I wish he would, though. You know, it would do my channel a lot of good. And, of course, this is the starting point for uh, this video. Loive is a singer-songwriter from Iceland. Um, she now re resides in Los Angeles. She was uh, an ex-Berkeley music student. She obviously really knows her stuff. She started playing a whole host of different instruments at the age of four. I think she started on the cello when she was like that, around about that age. Um, she's from a very musical family, um, classical background. She's played in orchestral, you know, she played orchestral music. And she's got a real great interest in jazz, especially vocal jazz. And she's um, really sort of entered the pop market a little bit like Samara Joy, who's another singer that's come out and won all these Grammys and stuff. You know, basically making pop music, but with a very, very strong jazz influence. And this is very interesting, exciting for us who love jazz, because um, when you've got an artist like Loive, who has got 13 million listeners a month, you know, and thousands of young people singing back all this incredible, you know, jazz and bebop vocabulary, that's a wonderful thing. And Adam makes that point right at the start. Um, the video is uh, broken into sort of three thirds and the first third Adam asks what does make this jazz and his um, basic um, point is is the generic qualities right so let's just examine that for a little bit um, most styles of music are defined entirely on their generic qualities you know so if you like heavy metal and you grow up being influenced by heavy metal and then you go on to make music that sounds like heavy metal because you're influenced by heavy metal, it's highly likely that someone will say, yeah, that's a heavy metal artist. Um, if you move too far stylistically from what we consider to be heavy metal, then um, people will start saying, well, that's not really heavy metal. There's too much reggae in it or there's too much funk in it. You know, but if you get it right about, you can push the boundaries out a little bit. And that's how most genres work. But with jazz, jazz as we've Finding out on this channel has all this other stuff attached to it, you see. And I think part of it is, is because jazz is improvisatory, because jazz is in the moment, um, we expect jazz to sort of move forward and not necessarily just um, copy stylistically what happened in the past. But of course, as I have pointed out, there's also this incredibly conservative part of jazz where people think they're very worthy if they are mining music from the past. And this really comes out on this video in that, um, to start off with, Adam says, well, these are the aspects that might make people think she's jazz. And those aspects are her influences and the stylistic choices. 
She's grown up listening to, you know, all the sort of jazz singers, Ella Fitzgerald, Sarah Vaughan, and especially Chet Baker. And um, Chet Baker's very cool delivery of the vocal, and that sort of, because Chet Baker was primarily a jazz trumpeter, he sang in a very sort of West Coast post-bebop style, which is very cool. It's not that emotive. And uh, Loive has a similar sound in her voice to Chet Baker. You can hear that. She's also um, very influenced by the sort of bossa nova craze that uh, came out with Stan Getz and National Gilberto in the early 60s. And she um, uses that sort of sound, which is quite interesting because bossa nova doesn't necessarily swing. It grooves, but it swings. It doesn't swing, sorry. So, um, and that fits in a lot more with a sort of contemporary, like, um, too steppy or maybe even a sort of um, the sort of modern hip hop groove. You could see that that's more relatable, that straighter, you know, broken up pulse than the sort of swing of jazz. And that, of course, that sort of much straighter style of um, rhythmically grooving is very hip at the moment in mainstream jazz circles. So um, he points out that this, this sounds like jazz. It has the same harmonic structures, the same chords. It has the same sort of chord progressions, a similar sound, you know, there's bossa nova influences and influences with all these jazz singers. Um, and I, and I, I'm sat there thinking, well, yeah, if it sounds like jazz and it looks like jazz, then maybe it is jazz. At this point, then he starts to um, put the counter argument of, and we get into the second third, which is, uh, why is this not jazz? Right, now I've got some notes here, specifically so I know what Adam said. So, um, the first point he makes is she writes her own songs. Um, this is where the confusion starts to, <laughs> to go for me because he's, he's going, well, look, she is sort of looking into the past. We'll get onto this in a minute, but uh, she's looking back into the past. He has this sort of idealised view from Gen Z of what jazz is, you know, she is not of jazz. This is the overriding reason, I think, why Adam... Uh, doesn't think that uh, Loive is jazz. She is not of jazz. She has not got the spirit of jazz. You know, she's not part of the jazz community or the jazz ethos. This is a Gen Z person looking back at jazz and sort of mimicking what she thinks jazz should be. Now, this doesn't ring true, especially if she went to Berkeley. She would have got, gone through a training where she was would have been taught how to play jazz or at least how you do go about playing jazz and her music is incredibly sophisticated i've got to be honest i've had a listen to her and there's not much much modern stuff i like but i love what she's doing i think it's brilliant i think she's absolutely brilliant incredibly talented musician so um the fact that she's looking back and she's mimicking these old songs but of course those old musicians back in the 40s they weren't necessarily writing their own compositions. What they were doing was playing sort of popular songs of the day, usually taken from musicals or sometimes taken from the hit parade. And then jazz musicians would transmute those by taking the structure and pushing it to a certain point. Um, and because Loive is not doing that, she's mimicking that genre, but what she's doing is... Um, using that to write her own songs that speak to that generation, Adam feels that this is not jazz, which is really odd to me because um, it opens up with Loive playing Misty. Now, Misty is a song written by Errol Garner. Now, he didn't necessarily write the lyrics. The lyrics could have been written by somebody else, but that was often the structure back then. But this idea that jazz musicians don't write their own music, don't write their own songs, is is really based upon jazz around about 1940, early 50s. Um, once um, the vinyl album came out um, and people were able to do more, you know, rather than just bringing out one track, and people were trying to trigger the pop hits of the day because rock and roll had come out and we get that sort of emergence. Jazz musicians become much more auteur if that is a word. You know, they start to make their own music. And of course, jazz composition is very important, going right back to Duke Ellington. Now, um, the idea that musicians didn't write songs, right, is not the case. And by the time we get to the 70s, most jazz musicians who were performing vocal music 
they are involved in the songwriting process very often. The idea we can discount somebody because they're writing their own songs doesn't work for me. So I don't think we can use this as a, as a basis of saying this is why Louis Vuitton is not jazz. Um, the next thing is, of course, we get the holy trinity of uh, jazz appear and he shows clips of Winter Marsalis Stanley Crouch and Ken Burns. Now I don't want to get into all that because I've done loads of videos on that. But it's interesting that um, Adam, who, who has, has also said that he doesn't necessarily agree with their view of what jazz is, that sort of, you know, young lions, <coughs> conservative view of jazz, which um, I've spoken about a lot on this and I will um, put a link up there to a video if you really want to see my opinion about that. Um, He's still quoting them, and they come in with a definition of jazz, right? And um, I find this definition troublesome. And on this channel, I have never tried to go for a definition of jazz. Now, I'm, my, my, um, what I go for is the things that jazz pioneered. So jazz does a whole ton of stuff, right? But when we look at what's unique about jazz for me, what it is, is having an individual voice, right? So performing a song or a tune with your own voice rather than conforming to the voice that the composer expects. That's one of the big differences for me. The second one would be the idea of groove. Now they talk about swing, but I think that the innovation is not swing. You can't say that's not jazz because it's not swinging, right? It just doesn't make sense. Do I have to go through all the jazz that doesn't swing? You know, Keith Jarrett, Con is that is that not um, jazz? Does it swing or does it not swing? You know, um, all the stuff that's got funk grooves behind it. So jazz fusion. And Adam's almost like, he is, um, on this video, um, he has rationalised that sort of Ken Burns, Winter Masada, Stanley Crouch thing by going... Um, Jazz fusion isn't jazz, it's like a, 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 a naughty little younger brother or something. That's how he describes it. Um, and I, to me, jazz fusion is jazz. That's the whole point. I think that's what annoys me about the gatekeepers, you know, because there's a whole ton of jazz musicians that made music for the last 50 years, which I consider jazz, you know. And a lot of that music doesn't swing, but it grooves, right? Now think about what jazz pioneers, up until jazz comes out, what grooves? There's stuff that's like dancey, there's stuff you can dance to that's got a pulse, but this idea of having an internal sort of visceral motor groove in it that you appreciate as a being a foremost characteristic of the music, I think is one of the things that jazz pioneered. Um, the other thing I think that jazz pioneers is the use of improvisation within the compositional structure. Not just improvising, but improvisation being key to the structure of the tune. In other words, you can't really perform this tune unless you improvise. Those aren't necessarily definitions for me. What they are, are um, things that jazz innovated and pioneered. It's what makes jazz special. But I think to the idea of then setting that as a limit means that if somebody, and Adam makes this point on the video, if somebody like Duke Ellington's musicians are just playing one of his compositions, we have to say, okay, that's not jazz anymore, right? Um, I think um, one of the problems we have um, with sort of modern philosophy is this idea of seeing people as being groups. We're dealing with the, the, the group of musicians that make jazz, rather than seeing it that um, there's this style of music and individual musicians are defined by that. So if Louis Armstrong is then defined because he's a jazz musician, we judge him individually. And so if he then sings, you know, we've got all the time in the world for James Bond film, it's still jazz because it's defined by Louis. Louis makes it jazz. I think this is something that's really important. You know, if I buy a you know, Chet Baker album or Charlie Parker album or Miles Davis album, whatever they're doing, it's defined as jazz because that guy is, themselves is defined by jazz because of what they do. And they are allowed at certain points to push against the limits of that, but as a whole. So what I'm saying, I think, is that I take the whole thing as an average rather than sitting there pointing going, that bit's jazz, that bit's jazz, or that's not jazz, that's not jazz, or that bit was jazz, and on the whole there's more not jazz than jazz, so maybe this isn't jazz. The whole thing's preposterous, you know. And so, um, 
we have this definition as though it's set in stone, even though Adam Neely says it's not set in stone and he doesn't agree with it. Now, their definition is it's got swing, right? It's got the blues in it and it uses improvisation. Now, I think if we were to say that something isn't jazz because it hasn't got the blues in, suddenly we start to discount a whole ton of music that we would class as jazz. Anthony Braxton, certain aspects of free jazz, um, European improvised music, um, Keith Jarrett's piano improvisations, all these things, the thing, very things that were discounted by Ken's Birds in the jazz documentary, suddenly that's not jazz, okay? Um, then they make a very strange point about jazz being adult music, and it's appreciated by adults and young people can't get into it because they're disengaged from it. Yes, you bet. You want to know why? Because of the gatekeepers. I am an educationalist and I've met so many students, music students of like 16 years old, who I can see have that want to push music improvisationally forward and are tentatively starting to go towards jazz. They find an interest in that and then suddenly they hit the wall of playing the changes, having the right tone, having the right sound. And this is the classic classifying of jazz as in classical music. It's, it's the uh, Western Euro European model of what music is, uh, the, the worthiness of that music transplanted onto jazz. And I've done a video on this where I've really explained why I think this has happened. This has happened over the last 40 years. Jazz has become the American classical music and it now reeks of a whole bunch of values that really come from Western European art music. And if you're not conforming to that, we know how snotty that is, if you're not conforming to that, suddenly you're not jazz. You might be great, you know, but you're not jazz. So just, you know, and that, that's what I think is going on here. And it's going on here at a level which is underneath the sort of uh, the awareness of the people who are saying it. I don't think that it's a subconscious um, level of just accepting these sort of dogmas. Right, so um, so this idea that young, pe young people are always have a magnetic attraction towards jazz if they're musicians. The gatekeepers come and stop them from coming in. What we want in musicians bringing in from their, their sort of youth culture and their spirit, we want that going into jazz. That's what needs to keep jazz alive. Whereas on this video, Adam Neely is continually saying, oh, there's these Jazz Z references, or she's using lyrics that would be, you know, uh, uh, talking about relationships and talking about things that young people are interested in. And this sort of somehow is, makes it not jazz. Maybe it does make it not jazz, but what I'm saying, it should, you know, jazz should be letting this stuff in, right? Um, okay, so um, when we look at what Stanley Crouch um, says later on, so Stanley Crouch comes up with this definition and he says it's the blues, it's swing and improvisation. And then later on he starts to talk about having an individual voice and how you integrate that individual voice into an ensemble. That, that is a really powerful thing, right? It's part of my um, innovatory list because I'm not gonna try not to use the word definition of jazz. And I think that's very important. If we use that idea of jazz, then Tina Turner's jazz and Madonna's jazz, it's all jazz. And you know what? It kind of is. This is the problem we're dealing with. Jazz is such an important music um, form that a lot of the stuff that's happening um, sort of contextually um, about how people talk about jazz is actually limiting jazz. And I feel that jazz is about freedom and it is about how you negotiate your freedom with the person next to you. I really think that's an important thing. And I think that um, it should be able to let these things in. And this gatekeeperiness is stopping it from happening. Um, and I think Crouch makes a really important point there. Um, if that is the case, of course, Loive, obviously she has found her own personal voice and um, she is integrating that into an ensemble in, in an original way and in a new way. Because later on, Adam then starts to say, it's not a jazz group. She's performing in what's a pop group because they've got in-ears and they're using Ableton Live on stage and things like this, or Pro Tools or whatever it was. This is all bonkers. What? It's like, 
It's the same thing as when jazz musicians plugged in electric guitars and start to use electric pianos and everybody thought that was jazz because it was electrified. You've got to realise with jazz fusion, it wasn't so much the rock beats everybody was upset by, it was the electric instrumentation that they didn't like because it wasn't pure, it wasn't authentic. This is an aspect of jazz that's always been there and I think it's all a bit fake, right? Um, now, as the video goes on, we get onto the very contentious uh, subject area, and I know I'm dicing with this one, where there is an ideological dogmatic point made, which can't be questioned, which of course, jazz is black American music, all right? We're not allowed to question that. I have been questioning it on this channel. I've had a little bit of kickback. I am not questioning it because I'm some sort of racist who wants to diminish the input of uh, um, Afro-Americans on jazz music history or even music history. Anyone who's watched this channel will know that that is absolutely not the case with me. And it's actually, I think, ironically, this approach is diminishing the achievements of incredible Afro-American musicians. That's what I feel, right? Um, when I go back and look at the history of jazz, the deeper I get into it, it seems that it was in the 19th century, a melting pot of all sorts of music, which is really fundamentally rooted in European music forms, marching music. It used that instrumentation, it used that arrangement, it used those instruments, it uses techniques from that. And it's a sort of Americanization um, with a ton of influences, including a ton of Afro-American influences. Um, this, the idea that um, it's a, it's a, a, a black music form, no race owns any style of music, right? But I would argue the blues was created by Afro-Americans. It wasn't created by Africans, it wasn't created by black people, it was, it, it was created by a very specific uh, group of black people, Afro-Americans, and I think the blues is totally, I've studied that history, and it seems apparent that the call and response and, and the sort of pentatonic pen scales, we can all see the influences of this sort of um, um, distant cultural deep memory within the American slave. That is what you're hearing in the blues. And that influence is in jazz. It's in jazz and it's, it's, it's entwined deeply in there, right? And I think that the fact that that was in there, it's the, it, the bringing in um, of, of the blues, but also stuff that happened, happened within minstrelsy, you know, that, that happened in that popular song. Those things were then taken up by a whole host of musicians. But for some reason, Right, and I will do a video on this when I've got my thoughts together. For some reason, the real geniuses that took this American music form and took it to a point where it became one of the most important art forms in the history of humanity were Afro-Americans. That's the difference. And they were individual Afro-Americans. And everyone, every one of them had their own reason Right, if you want to go back and look at their personal history or the culture that they grew up in, then it becomes very interesting because somebody like Louis Armstrong had a completely different upbringing for someone like Duke Ellington. You know, these two musicians were born two years apart and they were both, you know, growing up in an incredibly racist society. But Louis Armstrong, you know, learned to play trumpet in the, the you know, the coloured waif's home you know, uh, running around the streets of New Orleans, whereas Duke Ellington used to have like Theodore Roosevelt, the president, come down and watch him play baseball when he was a, a, a lad in Washington. And he turned down um, a, a, a scholarship to uh, arts college, you know, to study there. He had piano lessons, he was well educated, right? Now, did he experience racism? Of course he did, but those are two different people. And when we look at Louis's music and we then see the Louis wish to please the audience, to entertain the audience, to bring in popular songs and humour and all that, whereas we see Duke Ellington's desire to make jazz 
like a classical music and have that worthiness of that compositional bass. These are two different aspects and they both exist in jazz. Thank God there was nobody around there going, well, what's Duke Ellington doing? This isn't jazz. It should be all jolly like Louis Armstrong and have all this. This is, this is the idiocy of this, really. Um, Adam Neely just takes it as gospel that this is black American music. And although it's not stated, he's sort of, Full, full endorsement of Samara Joy, incredible jazz singer, you know, real Sarah Vaughan influenced jazz singer. Um, you feel like, you know, this, this um, Loive, who is not Afro-American, is from Iceland, from a classical tradition. Can, can they really start, are they going to really, really play jazz? Is, you know, is that right? Is, is this person part of the community? We get a whole bunch of things at the end of the video about the jazz community. And, and the sort of um, institution of jazz, as though that should be respected, right? As though that should be, you know, and if, it, and if, well, if, you, if, you, if you're not part of that computer, it's, it's okay, you're making great music, but we're not really going to call it jazz, right? Now, um, anyone who watches my channel will know I make mistakes left, right and centre, so I'm not having a go at Adam for making a mistake, but he does make a big mistake in this video. Uh, early on, when he's talking about Loive's influences he refers to Ella Fitzgerald as Lady Day. Now um, this video is incredibly well researched with all sorts of historical detail that no jazz aficionado would have off the top of their head. Anyone who watches my channel will know that what I try and do is come in and talk to you off the top of my head. I haven't really um, structured or really thought about this video. I've got some notes of what Adam says, but what I'm saying to you now is what's coming out now, right? And as I was talking a few minutes ago, I thought, he didn't he call Ella Fitzgerald Lady Day? It's just occurred to me as I'm talking to you, because I found it odd when he did it, because this is the guy that knows everything about jazz, surely. Now, I'm not calling him out to make a mistake. I've made some incredible mistakes on this video, um, on this YouTube. I just did it then on this YouTube, not video, right? I'm doing it all the time, as you know. But I don't think I would have made that mistake. I don't think, I might have forgotten the nickname for Billy Holiday because I'm getting a bit old and sometimes I can't pull the stuff out of my brain that well. But I don't think I would make a mistake like calling Ella Fitzgerald Lady Day. Anybody who knows about jazz at all knows that Lady Day was the name given to Billie Holiday by the Prez Lester Young in the 1930s when um, jazz musicians who were outsiders, who weren't playing classical music, that weren't part of the American dream, started to give themselves names. You know, Paul Whiteman, and his surname says it all, uh, was crowned by, you know, the American people, the king of jazz. So, you know, these Afro-American jazz musicians said, well, you, you could be Count Basie, you could be Duke Ellington, you know. Lou Armstrong will be Pops, he's the father of it, you know. Um, we've got President Young there, and Billy, you could be Lady Day. And I think this is a wonderful thing because it points to the outsideriness of jazz at that time. It wasn't part of the mainstream. It wasn't part of academic study and people with PhDs pontificating on what jazz is and what jazz isn't and what it should be and what it isn't. It wasn't like that. Most jazz musicians didn't care or even know about the history of jazz. They got up and played because they were part of this thing that was jazz and at that point it was alive and they felt free to do whatever they want and they were pushing against the boundaries of it. Now the fact that Adam Neely makes such a basic error and yet this video is so full of incredible facts about jazz. I learned stuff about, you know, I, I didn't know that like the, the vocal groups, like the Andrew, the Andrew sisters or singers or whatever it was. Um, what was it, the Andrew, it was the Andrew sisters one, I don't know. Was it the Beverly sisters? See, this is what happens when you can do this, you know, but um, not Lady Day. But I didn't know anyway that they, they were um, 
you know, there was all these vocal harmonizations that was mimicking Big Band came out because of the writer strike. I knew about the writer strike, I knew all that. I hadn't just hadn't put that together. I was interested. And that's what I appreciate about Adam is 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 the, the stuff that's on there, this information. It's 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 brilliant stuff. I've learned a lot watching this channel. So how come he doesn't know about Lady Day? How come? And the reason is it's because Adam is the product of that white, middle-class, hyper-privileged jazz, ex-jazz student thing that exists right now. And it's all intellectual. And people are looking at this thing, and the thing is, it's of a value to them because it validates them. Jazz validates a whole bunch of people who are walking around with a PhD in jazz, basically. It validates them, all right? And um, if they start to let that be soiled by saying Loive is a jazz musician, it starts to upset the apple, apple cart and the community. And we get these videos of, of these sort of modern rent parties going on in New York at the, at the, the, uh, at the moment. And um, you get that feeling that I always get when I watch Adam Neely. And it's that feeling that here I am sat in the West Midlands in the UK, right? I've only ever been, so I've just banged this cymbal. I've only ever been to New York once, and that was when I was in, on tour with the prog band, and I drove through it and saw Statue of Liberty. Went, wow, it's a Statue of Liberty over there, wow. You know, that is, that is the limit. I sat here as a jazz fan, here. I grew up, heard jazz from the year, Doc, because my dad was into it, and I love this style of music. And, you know, and I've played it, and I've studied it, and I've bought it and I just love it but I'm sat here I'm not in that cool place in New York I'm not part of those you know red parties I'm not part of that scene and what Adam Neely says virtually by the end of this video is if you're not part of that scene then you shouldn't or you you, you have to respect that in some way respect what I, I'm, I'm in when I really watched it, and I, th and I thought, I'm going to critique this. Actually, one of my patrons, and thank you for this, because they pointed it out to me, and said, Andy, you're going to have to get your teeth into this one. And I thought when I watched it, I would go, right, you know, I don't agree with that, I agree with that. But actually, I can't quite get my hands on what the point is Adam is making on this video. I, it's, it's like, um, he, he, he seems invested in trying to show that Loive is not jazz, right? And he's trying to find reasons to say why it's not jazz. And yet, the, because he's a very intelligent guy, he's outside himself going, why am I doing this for? Why am I, why am I gatekeeping jazz? And then the, the, the jazz student, the person that's been, you know, brainwashed by the ideological, you know, approach of modern jazz education is going, no, just keep going. Get the gate out, shut it, get her out. You know, we don't want that soiling. We don't want this modern pop music, Gen Z. You know, she's not swinging. She doesn't swing, you know. I mean, this is like 1980s sort of conservative, conservatives and raising its head. You know, oh, she, they don't swing, you don't swing. I've had that, you know, said to me once, you know. Oh, you know, well, the thing with, you know, you, you don't swing. What, what does that mean? You know, these are the things that beat people over the head, you know. It's like Peter Erskine sat there, you know, saying if you go, you have to go, you can't go, you can't do that. I watched a video with Peter Erskine saying, you can't do that. I was thinking, why? Why can't you do that? You know, um, it's like all jazz drummers used to play the hi-hat on two or four, one, two, three. And Tony Williams comes on and he's, he's doing that, you know. Then Jack to John Eck comes in and he's going, all this, and I'm going, oh, you know. That's not how you do it. Jack, you should go back and play like Art Blakey. Go back and play like Max Rowe. Yeah, in fact, go back and play like Zutty Singleton. Or Baby Dodds. That's what you should be doing. You're not, you're not jazz now because you're doing it different. Right? I, this video, I was hoping to do a very rational you know, breakdown, and I tried my best at the start, but I gotta be honest, I'm on one now, I, I don't get it, right? I'm not saying I've got all the answers, I've tried my best on this channel to come up with some 
commentary about this, but I've got to be honest, if I really am, <laughs> if I'm really honest, and I've got to be honest, so I will be honest, when I step back, I don't get it. I don't get what Adam Neely is trying to do on this video. I don't get it. Now, you could say, well, Loive has got 30 million, you know, listeners on Spotify, you know, she is technically the biggest jazz artist in the world. People are putting really awful sort of um, critique videos up. Adam's an intelligent guy. He's put a really good one up and it's going to get the views and he will make some money. And I'm sure that, and I don't begrudge anybody that. And here I am, you know, um, trying to jump on Adam Neely's back, you know, and I'm nearly... <laughs> Can I use that word here? I nearly, with Adam Neely, I nearly thought of having this diagram which had Loi Ve here, 24 years old, and she, she's like this giant in of contemporary culture. And then next to that is a tiny Adam Neely who's, who's like, you know, going, I don't think you're jazz. And then there's me, and I'm even tinier, like right down the bottom, and I'm going, and Adam, I don't think you're right. Well, who are you? Anyway, I don't think you're jazz. And Loi Ve's going, oh, someone told me that this guy on YouTube makes a video about me. Anyway, should we just get back to selling millions of records and being a huge megastar? What is the point in it all? What is going on? Well, what's going on is this. It's this. You know, it's all of us trying to grab something out of what is there, you know. Jazz died, and, and I, that was the thing that um, I loved about this video, and I agree with Adam, you know, he just came out and said it. Jazz is, is, is dead, it's died. It's a museum piece. You know, they talk, talk loads about, you know, Bill Evans at the Village Vanguard, Ness Browser Spalding alive at the Village Vanguard, and yeah, you can arrive in New York if you're a rich person and go down to the Village Vanguard. I can't go, I can't afford to go, I, I'm having to work. But if you're, if you're, if you know, if that way inclined, you can go to New York and you can walk down, right? And you can pretend you're in the, 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 the jazz world and go into the Village Vanguard and feel like you are in this place. Now, on the video, Adam Neely used this argument the other way around. He said, oh, the Village Vanguard is a live jazz venue and, you know, people are still doing stuff there. But because she said she was transported when she listened to Bill Evans. Transported to when, he says. Transported to when? Back in time to this imaginary idea of what you think jazz is? Right? I'm pretty sure that's what you... you know, when people go down to jazz clubs in New York, that's what it is. But the most important thing here is when I saw her say that, I thought she meant transported in the way that music transports you. It transports you to this other realm. This beautiful realm of otherness. And when you listen to Bill Evans Live at the Vigic Vanguard, the reminder that there's people there eating their dinner and clinking, you know, their cutlery. And at the same time, there's this incredible music which is transporting you up beyond this earthly realm. That's what I thought, but that's just my opinion, isn't it? And it's just Adam's opinion to think that what she meant when she said transported was transported to some Gen Z version of what she thinks jazz is. Right? I'm trying to be honest on this video. I'm trying to um, not come off as... I know I've done that on some of these videos. I'm trying here not to come off as the clever guy that's going to go, oh, I, don't, I think Adam's wrong, actually, and I've got the right idea of what jazz is. Then somebody else, you know, will come along and say, well, Andy Edwards is actually wrong. We could all go around in a big circle saying what jazz is and what jazz isn't. Right, I think the thing is, let's just say we love jazz. It's an amazing art form. And I know it when I hear it. And when I heard Loi Ve, I thought, well, this is jazz. But this is jazz in the same way as um, Harry Connick Jr.'s jazz. But Harry Connick Jr. is jazz, right? When Robbie Williams gets up and he does that Frank Sinatra album, he sings with a big band, is that jazz? Yeah. If he'd have made a heavy metal album, it would have been a heavy metal album. But when Robbie Williams gets on stage with a big band behind him and sings Frank Sinatra songs, that's jazz. It's generically jazz. Right? Is it Pharaoh Saunders? Of course it's not. Because this is a big genre. And in this genre, 
We have music which is high art intellectual, but we also have a bunch of music which then became from the blues, rhythm and blues, soul, R&B, rock and roll, jump music, jive music, reggae, funk, dance music, hip hop, rap. All of that has a little bit. Keep banging the irons. Has a, have, have a little bit of. Um, I'm doing my shoelace up now. I'm, 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 so, I'm so into this one that I'm sitting here just chatting, banging my cymbals and tying my shoelaces up. I'm, 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 I, I, it's so not the way I wanted this to go, I tell you. Um, but I feel I've explained my opinion of it. I, and I, as I said, I love Adam Neely. I think he's great. But I think he's a product of that jazz education system. And I think it's all about being intellectual and clever. And now he has a YouTube video, it's all about trying to jump on the back of uh, Loive and get some uh, intellectual views and likes on his channel. And there's nothing wrong with that. But what he's saying doesn't really make that much sense. A lot of it um, doesn't add up. Um, I don't think it determines whether she is jazz or she is. And in, in the end, I don't think she cares. I don't care. I don't even think even Adam Neely cares. You know, what is it all about? Anyway, I think I've got to the end of the video now. I hope you enjoyed this. It didn't go the way I wanted. I bet I haven't said everything I wanted to say. Is it? Have you ever seen that uh, Herbie Hancock interview when he's saying, what was it like playing with Miles Davis? And he says, it's like having a conversation with some, somebody. And he goes, you know that thing where um, you have an idea? He goes, oh, I'll say that point. But then the conversation goes somewhere else. And you think, oh, well, I didn't make my point. But it was an interesting place we went. Um, that's what this video has been like. Like Herbie Hancock playing for Miles Day. That's what it's been like. That's the level I'm at. Not Adam Neely. What is he? And the other thing is I forgot to do. Oh, boom. I was going to do a little bit of a parody because he stand, he stood up. He's like this. He stood up and he's got his mug, right? He's got his, he's got his white mug. And I was going to be holding a mug in mine. And I forgot to get the mug, right? And I like this because it's like Adam's there, he's, he's, in his, he's in his dark flat and he's having a walk around and he's, he's thinking about, you know, altered dominance and, you know, and the market possibilities of the, the flat third moving to the major third. And he's, he's, he's like that and he's got his cup of tea because he's just hanging out. And then he just walks over to the camera, switches on, and then he comes out with all this stuff that he's worked out for, for the past month that he's going to say and then makes a terrible error like Lady Day. But the fact that the, the mug really says more about what that video is about than um, I think what he's actually saying. Now, I have got a Christmas pudding. And um, so I haven't got a mug, but I will finish this video holding a Christmas pudding that will represent the white mug of Adam Neely. The white mug of worthy intellectualness. That is what this is representing here. This Christmas pudding. I do believe it makes a sound. But the question is, is that jazz? And I tell you, there's a strange smell that comes out of this when you do that. And it's not Christmas pudding smell, I tell you that. Oh my God. It's been here for a while. I bet there's been some sort of infestation inside here. I didn't like that at all. I didn't expect that at all. Um, anyway, well, so I haven't done the mug, but I've done the Christmas pudding. What else haven't I done? Um, uh, Loive points out the gatekeepers. Yes, she does. She's aware of the gatekeepers and the importance of conforming to tradition and it denies all non-US jazz. Yeah, so um, this is a big thing for me. If you accept Adam Neely's definition, I have said this earlier on, but I think it's a really important point, then, because I'm not part of the community, I've said all this, I'm just ranting on now, I've, I've, I've covered it all. I've covered it all. Is there anything I wanted to say? Oh yeah, one more thing. But, um, there's one point where he goes, um, here's Loive playing in front of an orchestra but she's not interacting with that orchestra, right? So it's not jazz. No musician who plays in front of an orchestra interacts with that orchestra, right? When Winter Marsalis made that Hot House Flowers album, that, you know, that real, you know, 
crass bid at commerciality when he was the biggest thing on the planet and he stood up in front of an orchestra and played this sort of Nelson Riddle type arranged jazz. Those musicians weren't listening to Winter and going, oh, I might do that because Winter did that. And Winter was going, oh, God, the violins all did that in unison and I didn't expect it, so I'll react to that. They wanted, that's not what's going on. Nobody does this. The whole thing's bonkers. The whole thing is bonkers. What the hell is going on? I'm definitely at the end of the video now. I'm getting, I'm getting, I'm getting worn out. Acting like this. All right. Um, if you like this video, then please like it. And if you want to see more, subscribe and ring the notification bell. And if you want to support me, you've got two ways. You can go over to my Patreon and become a patron. And there's a ton of content over there. I've talked about this over and over again. But if it's the first video you've seen by me, go. And, you know, you're not. Well, you're not going to become a patron anyway, are you? If you only watch one video, you're going to at least have watched four videos, I would have said, before you decided to become a patron, maybe even ten. But if you want to support me anyway, there's a patron over there, and uh, come on over and say hello. It's, it's, uh, I do enjoy it over there with my patrons. We have a lot of fun. Um, I was uh, posting photographs of large dogs this morning. Um, yes, it's, if you think this is surreal, you want to go over to Patreon. Um, and if, you, if Patreon's not your thing... I have a YouTube tip jar down there. Click it and give me some money because I do like money. Me and Adam both like money and we like money coming from our YouTube viewers because this is what I want to do. This is what Adam wants to do. Adam, if you have happened to watch this and you haven't seen any of my videos, that I do have a sort of English sarcastic sense of humour and I do rib. But like I said at the beginning of the video, I do love your channel. I think it's absolutely wonderful. And uh, don't be prejudiced against me if you do want to mention me and, you know, send a few of your vast million subscribers my way. I would like that very much. I can't tell you how much I would. Anyway, thanks for watching the video. I'll see you on the next one. Bye bye.